This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. I'm your host, Steph Storer, and I'm here today with the brilliant author and historian, Lawrence Burgreen, to talk about explorers in the Tudor era. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm glad to be with you. So our topic today is a new one for me, actually, one that I really don't know that much about. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you because I, I admittedly do not know much about exploring or that section of history. So our first listener question to kick things off is about how explorers at the time can get started. How would one end up in a profession like this? back in Tudor days? Uh, well, uh, keep in mind, that's a really interesting, good question. Their assumptions about society and the world and even the, the earth and the cosmos were different from ours. And, uh, you know, it was sort of similar, but really quite different. Many of them were uh, what we would call uh, pirates um, or even slave traders, but they didn't think of themselves as that way at all. They thought of themselves as uh, commercial entrepreneurs or carrying out uh, the Queen's, you know, Queen Elizabeth's um, wishes or orders uh, while often surreptitiously enriching themselves in the process. Um, of course, there are assumptions about, you know, that human rights. Uh, or uh, human dignity are, are, are quite different from ours. And so a lot of what they did would be completely distasteful and repugnant today. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen in some parts of the world, um, but it, it, it was quite different. Also, um, almost all of them felt that they had the will of God blessing, if not commanding them to do various things, whether it was Columbus or Magellan or others, they often felt that they were simply enacting not only their sovereign's wishes, but, you know, the higher power, the superpower's wishes. That made them both foolhardy and courageous at the same time. So it was a combination of self-interested exploitation, which we would find inhuman, and then, uh, you know, almost discordantly a spiritual kind of uh, aims. Many of them felt that they, or some of them felt that they were going on uh, a mission to bring Christianity to heathens and therefore save them. So they tried to see the good in what they were doing, even as they were exploiting the people. Also, one of the interesting things about exploration was the unintended consequences of what they did. Now, I should just back up for a second. Years ago, I was at a press conference and it was for a NASA spacecraft. And uh, there was a uh, one of the scientists who was a team leader. Was uh, She was a professor at MIT named Marie Zuber. And she was being questioned sharply by the press, you know, who were there, saying, well, what do you expect to explore? What are you going to explore? You know, we put all this money in this mission. What are you going to explore? And she said, you know, if we knew, fine, rather. She said, if we knew what we were going to find, it wouldn't be a discovery, would it? And so there is a certain amount of unknown about what they were doing. They really didn't know what they were doing. Most of them didn't know that the Pacific existed in its current form until Francis Drake came along. So that's the largest body of water on the planet. So their idea of how long it took to get from point A to point B was drastically different from others, from you know what what we see it as being now so a lot of their assumptions were were incredibly difficult or different what made some of them succeed i think was a lot of raw courage and determination and the sense that you know a higher power wanted them to do this when and was on their side of course many of them didn't succeed there are expeditions that were lost at sea that we know little, little or nothing about so I think it's this combination of uh, oversimplified greed and glory that makes it particularly interesting and human and, uh, you know, these sort of overpowering odds. I think that's some of the background of the exploration. So now say you're an explorer and you decide that it's whether it's because you're trying to exploit yourself, as you mentioned, or whether it's because you've been given a sign from God that it's time to do this sort of thing, you're ready to step out, you know, into the ocean and, and do your exploring now. How does one get to do that? Do they typically 
have to ask permission. Obviously, they need permission. They need funding. And how do they get, are these people already at court? Are they already wealthy? Do they already have means to get to the king or queen? How do they go about getting that permission and funding? As they, as they say, it depends. But let me see. I'll try and give you a, you know, a capsule summary. With Columbus, of course, he was famously, even though he was from Genoa, at the court of... Um, in in Spain of King King Joao in Portugal for years and King and Joao kept stringing him along for years and years and years. Columbus was hoping that he would get backing because he really couldn't get backing from anybody in Genoa particularly. Joao was good at doing that. Columbus wasn't the only one that he was uh, putting off like that. Portugal was an important player at that point for nefarious reasons because they were importing slaves from Africa. Portugal was very short of manpower, and that was their motivation for doing that. Anyway, eventually Columbus gave up in frustration and went to Spain and King Charles, Carlos, and uh, got a much better reception. His, his reputation as a skillful navigator in some earlier smaller expeditions around Europe had preceded him, and he was able to get backing for a voyage, he said, to China. Now, there were a couple of complications. First of all, really no one knew how to sail to China or where it was because obviously the Pacific is the major barrier, and they didn't realize how big it was. They thought maybe you could tra traverse it in, in a few days. The second problem was that there was a lot of mistrust and hostility, and he was surrounded by Spanish officers and mariners who thought they were actually in charge of, you know, the, this voyage. The, not only the first voyage that we all know about in 1492, but the subsequent ones, and there were three others that were closely spaced, and I think even more interesting than the first. And um, so there was a question of who's in charge, who's the boss? And this wasn't just confusion about, you know, who's responsible for uh, trimming the sails. Th this meant the threat of mutiny was ever present. A lot of these captains who were tyrants, essentially, faced that. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was an issue that went, um, you know, on and on. And, you know, eventually Columbus, you know, managed to uh, assert his authority. It was helpful that he was had the backing of his brother, Sebastian, who was also involved with uh, Magellan. Um, you know, it was also a similar issue. And simply maintaining control of this fleet was the most difficult part in some ways that he had to deal with. He was an expert sailor. And it seemed to me that the most hazardous, the biggest challenges that he fa faced were not natural ones, you know, the weather, the tides or things like that. It was his own sailors, his own crew, because they were so mutinous. So it, you know, it varied from one to another, but anyway, th they usually had to demonstrate to the sovereign, whether it was Elizabeth or King Charles, the value of their mission and what they were going to do and how it would expand uh, the empire. The, of course, the, the psyche, the points of view of the different so sovereigns varied widely. King Charles, uh, Spain was uh, tended to be kind of laissez-faire, and but he backed a lot of different expeditions. Joao, as I mentioned, was very secretive, and we actually don't know as much as we ought to about him because uh, you know the records didn't survive. A lot of them were lost in the notorious Lisbon earthquake, which came a couple hundred years later, and the records were kept there. There weren't duplicates, so a lot of exploration history uh, was lost in that event. And with Elizabeth, uh, secrecy was kind of the, the watchword of the day, but uh, this is with Drake, of course, but that was, as they say, more, more honored in the breach than the observance. So people knew what Drake was up to, and they, when they left at the beginning of this, what turned out to be a circumnavigation. It was not announced as a circumnavigation, and he, this was a follow-up to uh, Magellan a couple of a few decades later, it was just supposed to be, uh, you know, an expedition trying to defeat the Spanish. Drake had much more ambitious plan in mind. And the idea is once he got going, he was just going to keep going and going. And Elizabeth tacitly knew what he was doing. She had to keep a secret because she didn't want to 
uh, provoke war with Spain. At, at that time, at that time, um, it was a very uneven balance of power. The big, the giant, the 600-pound gorilla, if you will, in European uh, politics and uh, might. Uh, was Spain. They were the, by far the wealthiest and most sophisticated uh, kingdom, and uh, they had already uh, spread their influence across a lot of North America. England was considered a uh, kind of a Johnny-come-lately. They were much poorer. They were smaller. They were an island. They were not that well defended. The British Navy, such as it was, was uh, barely existed. So they were, you know, the underdog. And in a way, that was part of Drake's good fortune because people didn't worry about him too much. And yet he himself was uh, very courageous. And he, he had this this view that he, if he could circumnavigate the world, he could enhance England's prestige, add to the empire, and in some way, uh, I don't know, diminish or at least... Um, Put a limit to uh, Spain's uh, powers. So, but that that was uh, that kind of a wink, wink. He didn't mention that at all. He just said he, he was just going to get spices. They always said they were going spices, or he was going to uh, root out some of the Spanish outposts that were across North America. Drake was very sly, and uh, that stood him well because he, you know, didn't reveal his plans. And and also he was, a lot of these, to, to be really vernacular, a lot of these conquistadors and and courageous uh, sailors were very gloomy, gloomy gusses. <laughs> Columbus thought he heard the, uh, you know, voice of God speaking to him in moments of distress. A lot of people thought they heard the voice of God speaking to them in moments of distress. And uh, Magellan was, as far as we know about him, serious, 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 and uh, that that was, you know, perhaps the beginning and the end of describing what he was like. Drake was much more of a uh, buccaneer and uh, had a sense of adventure and sense of humor about what he was doing. This was a very different from the others. And, you know, in some ways, it's typically English. When he captured Spanish officers and sailors and soldiers, I think you hear a thunderstorm in the background, uh, you know, he didn't slaughter them and torture them. He simply uh, took all their weapons and whatever gold they had, many of them were sitting on deposits of gold, and then left them souvenirs uh, of his visit and sailed off. He didn't leave a bloody uh, wake or trail behind him. These souvenirs were, you know, a little uh, figurine or something as if to say Drake was here. And uh, then he sailed off. That was very unlike uh, Magellan or, or the others who were involved in, a, you know, what they saw as a much d darker struggle, you know, the forces of, of good and evil. They, uh, and also how, how you see them really, really varied. Um, you know, as I said, when, when they, somewhere, in some places, they were greeted as uh, deliverers, as uh, fulfillment of some prophecy which the explorers weren't even aware of. In other places, they were seen as a great threat or invasion, or it changed in the middle of their visit. Often, they started out neutral or friendly and then turned out hostile after a while. It sounds like Francis Drake was, was such an English gentleman as compared to the others, right? Uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> yes. Um, he, he was, yes, he was more... Uh, there was a sense of playfulness about him, and you, you can imagine him in, in some sort of a adventurous uh, novel or movie as a, as a figure of uh, debonair and calculating. And, uh, but, you know, he was also, you know, extremely courageous, and he was an excellent sailor. And I, you know, would have to say, but he wasn't really an angel either. You know, we, we can't say that any of these people were forces that were... Uh, completely benign, but they mostly felt that they were carrying out, you know, their sovereign's will and the Lord's will about what was right. And of course, some of their antagonists also thought that they were in the right. Right, right. One of the things that we wanted to know before you, if you just give us maybe some kind of an overview about the actual ships or life on the ships, who they brought with them and 
you know, even things such as food and weapons and how they navigated, things like that is, is all extremely interesting and, and definitely mentioned by our readers. But one of the things that came up a, a few times, actually, by the, by the, re, the uh, listeners was who got to come on the ships with them and were there ever any women? I, you know, if there were women, it was very poorly documented. There are some accounts of women pirates who, uh, you know, were considered to be as, uh, you know, rough and tough as as any male pirate. But almost all the explorers we're talking about uh, were men. And if there were women on board, it was, uh, as I said, not really well documented. They were mostly all men. You know, most of the crew tended to be uh, convicts or ex-convicts who basically had nowhere else to go and were pressed into service. And the idea of going to sea uh, was not a life of adventure. It was just considered a, you know, a, a slow, you know, method of execution because so many of these uh, crew members didn't return or the ship sank or were lost. Um, some actually did survive. The officers tended to be nobility and uh, they you know they whether it was minor or nobility but anyway they were therefore somewhat exempt from these ordinary concerns often they brought servants with them um, they brought their own they had their own food supply it you know it, it, it made a big difference so uh, there was really a distinct class distinctions really played out on these uh, voyages and, uh, you know, added to the tension uh, on board. They, they were not really harmonious in, any, in, a, in, a, in a human sense. They were, and they were microcosms of the tensions or societies that, from which they sailed. It was particularly confusing uh, with some of these uh, expeditions. Magellan had crew members from all over the world. I mean, uh, you know, not just, uh, he was Portuguese, of course, but um, he had, you know, the list of crew members. That, you know, there are at least a dozen different nations represented that meant different languages. Uh, the sailors had a common slang that they used to, you know, uh, communicate, but um, it, it also meant that they were um, alienated from each other or suspicious of each other. Uh, so uh, we don't think of it as being a happy place. Uh, once in a while, uh, there was a happy accident, you know, the right person at the right time. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Antonio Pigafetta, who was from Venice, um, which was, you know, the, a, a city-state, and he was not a professional sailor. And when he heard that Magellan was going on around the world, uh, plan to plan to go in a circumnavigation, um, he wanted to come aboard and uh, chronicle it. And he did. And even though so many of those people on that voyage didn't survive, he was one of the few, including Magellan, who didn't survive. Uh, Antonio Pigafetta survived. And his account, written in French, uh, first voyage around the world, you know, was an invaluable account of almost day-to-day -day life at sea, um, a close-up view of Magellan, uh, what the sailors were like. And it's, you know, it has a genuine... Uh, feel to it. So, you know, if you wanted to get a good sense of what it was like to sail around the world at that time with Magellan or maybe somebody else, that would be a good place to start because, you know, this was not a dry account. It was not a, a ship's log or a pilot's log where they just, you know, described their this position and that position and that position. Um, he, he gave a more subjective uh, account and vivid account. You are there, if you will. Of what it was like, partly because he was not a professional uh, seaman, and um, but he was a fairly sophisticated writer. Um, one of the most moving accounts, which I quoted a lot in my book about Magellan, was the death of Magellan um, when he got to Mactan Harbor in the Philippines. This was a, you know, one of the most uh, tragic or gruesome days in, in exploration, and he got into an unnecessary confrontation with the people who lived there who rebuffed him and didn't want Magellan and 
um, Pigafetta was standing shoulder to shoulder to him and described how uh, they cut him down with their fire-hardened bamboo swords. Um, there were a thousand of them, but only a couple dozen of Magellan and his men. Um, they felt that they would be protected by their uh, firearms and their metal armor, but it wasn't really enough to protect them. You know, the overwhelming numbers of the uh, Filipino uh, uh, tribesmen did him in, and uh, Pigafetta, who, who sort of idolized Magellan, writes movingly about it. Um, e even today, um, the uh, uh, Filipino who, who led that uh, charge against Magellan, uh, named Lapu Lapu, is commemorated and honored in the Philippines. And if you were to sail into Mactan Harbor, you would see a big statue, or maybe until recently there was a big statue um, in his name. At the same time, uh, Magellan is now really venerated in the Philippines because he brought Christianity to the Philippines. So, you know, it's it's complicated how people, you know, view these things, as I mentioned earlier, depending on your point of view. So on the one hand, uh, Magellan, and he, the same goes for other explorers as well, you know, is seen as an invader, a conqueror, an outsider. And on the other hand, a kind of a deliverer, especially, uh, you know, in a religious sense. Columbus also had this messianic version, uh, a messianic uh, um, interpretation of what he was doing or messianic conviction. And as he said, it was, it felt that it's not, it was even more than God was on his side. It was that he was carrying out an important uh, mission and, um, you know, they did spread uh, mistrust, uh, slaughter, disease that the uh, people they visited had no defenses against. Uh, and they also spread uh, Christianity which uh, is considered by you know, the people who have remained Christian to be a you know, very, very important boon. So um, it's, it, the consequences of these voyages are very, uh, you know, as I said, you know, they, they, they're, uh, we're always reevaluating about, about it. Of course, now we see Columbus as a villain, uh, you know, a bad guy. Um, I think, uh, you know, he was a complicated guy. He, he was bad, in, you know, in some ways. Um, he was also, if there had been no Columbus, uh, history would have been very different. It's, it's complicated. It is. Is it appropriate to ask you how you feel when people, um, you know, disparage some of these explorers? You know, everybody's got a point. Yeah. When you when you compare it to how we behave or how we conduct ourselves today, but as someone who is a historian, is a researcher, and obviously, as you mentioned, who knows, uh, based on your reading, that that things would be much different without them. What is your point of view? My point of view? Well, you know, when I'm writing a story, I get immersed in the story, and I try to feel, like maybe this is a an illusion that I don't particularly have a point of view. I'm really just trying to make the story as real and vivid as possible um, without uh, preaching about it, without, uh, you know, having a fixed ideological position. Obviously, if somebody's doing something horrible, you know, it's horrible. But, you know, I'm not uh, writing highly judgmental histories. And I, I think other historians of exploration, you know, are, are similar to that. They they just basically want to explain what happened, what the motivations were of the people. And I think you let the story speak for itself because it's good and bad. We, we know now we're looking at Columbus as a tyrant. Uh, 50 years ago, it was different. 50 years from now, now I, you know, I have no idea. I just wanted to, you know, explain what it had, what it was like, and uh, what he or Magellan or somebody else, um, you know, overcame. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it keeps perspective, keeps changing. And I think that's what makes history interesting, because, you know, our perspectives are not fixed. They are evolving uh, over time and uh, can look at, at uh, religious uh, impulses as being, you know, uh, leading to all sorts of unfortunate outcomes and uh, being uh, intolerant. On the, also, on the other hand, we can look at them as uh, inspiring a lot of courageous voyages and uh, important events. And, you know, so as I said, it, it really just depends. So I'm really just trying to tell the story.
Um, some of my models for doing this are, are uh, well, I mean, I think in some ways the sort of the the granddaddy of a uh, American naval historians is Samuel Elliott Morrison, who was a uh, Boston Brahmin and wrote many many books and taught at Harvard for many years. Um, but and and he had a, tried to adopt a similar objective uh, point of view. But uh, beyond that, I, I look back to historians, uh, ancient historians like uh, Tacitus or Livy and Thucydides, um, who are, you know, they're, they're, they do have a point of view. They do have a moral, um, but they're not really moralizing. They're, they're telling, you know, an account of what happened. And then the, the reader can draw her or his own conclusions. And, um, I, you know, I think that's, you know, probably a, a good way to go about it. Is it the only way? I don't know. But uh, that's that's what I do. I just get lost or involved in the story, and that becomes the most important part. I appreciate that. I appreciate that about you, and that's why you're you're so good at your job. Um, so back to kind of the ship itself and what they did daily on these voyages. So now they've got the okay from their sovereign. They they're ta- they're setting sail now. Who the types of people that you brought that they brought you had mentioned are some convicts, you say people, you know, lower class. And then what did they do? You know, how they get their food and how even just the ships themselves, did they buy them? Did they have them built? Tell us about the actual uh, journeys themselves. Well, the, the ships, yeah, the ships were built in uh, shipyards. They were, um, you know, they evolved slowly. They were a model. They were a combination of uh, European style, Longboats and then Arabian style or Eastern style sails and navigation. So this this the result was a hybrid called the Caravel, um, which was fairly light and maneuverable, um, but also sturdy. And most of these exploration that we're talking about were carried out in caravels, um, and uh, you know. They, they, sometimes they were, in theory, they were reusable, and some did sail on more than one voyage. Some got too badly, you know, bashed up and banged up uh, to do that. Um, they were usually made of uh, sturdy wood from, you know, spars that were, you know, it was, uh, they were strong. They were the green wood um, because it was uh, more, f- you know, flexible and resilient. And uh, but outside of that, the ships were basically very uncomfortable and really filthy. I think if uh, we were going to walk onto one of these ships, we would be struck by how you know harsh the conditions were and primitive, and how how everybody remarked on how much they smelled. And sometimes they carried livestock or other animals with them, so you had those kind of barnyard smells. And you know, people the sailors they didn't wash. You know, they they just. In those people, they just didn't. So they, many of these sailors, oddly enough, uh, didn't know how to swim, and uh, so they were afraid of the water. So they weren't about to jump in for a refreshing dip in the Pacific on, along the way. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, they slept on planks, or they brought, you know, some sort of sleeping gear for them, duffel, duffel, uh, like duffel bags. Um, they were often sleeping in shifts that were four hours uh, at a time so they you know didn't get much sleep um, the food i think uh, the best word to describe it is terrible and uh, they had uh, biscuits that they brought with them from a, you know a port um, usually the last port they visited um, these usually got often got infested uh, with uh, weevils or other vermin so it was kind of disgusting but they ate it anyway they could catch fish if they wanted to. Um, there are accounts of, uh, you know, Columbus's voyage and Magellan's of, you know, flying fish landing on the decks and uh, providentially. And so they caught them and ate them. And uh, sometimes they would find, uh, if they were in the Pacific, especially uh, crabs or something else, um, and would eat them. So they, they, they were foraging. Uh, and, uh, now the the um, crew, the cap the uh, captains and the were uh, ate a little better. They sometimes brought some food uh, with them, and uh, 
so they had a somewhat higher class of uh, food, but still it was, you know, the, the food was, was basically terrible. You know, there was no, there was nobody particularly who was a cook uh, or chef who came along to, to task with preparing meals for the, for the crew. So it was uh, rather informal and uh, irregular. Of all the interesting points you just made, I don't know why I'm sitting here stuck on pointing out that you said that the sailors didn't know how to swim. Well, they <laughs> that didn't know seems how to swim. that seems crazy. I know, but it's true. <laughs> um, they they were afraid of the water, and uh, you know you would think swimming would be second nature to them. And you know you do read accounts about how the sailors swam out to something. So maybe some of them could, but. Basically, they did not go in the water. They, this uh, is a risky profession, for sure, then. Yes, yeah. yes. And they were, you know, they weren't really, you know, we now think of all the training that sailors have or explorers, but um, they didn't have it then. And it, it was, as I said, it's kind of amazing. It, you know, there was more courage um, and faith than anything else. Um, you know, uh, Columbus and the others, some of the navigators were skillful sailors. And what did they use for navigation? Oh, uh, they used a compass and um, they often just sailed by the tides, the same as they, they did around around Europe. Uh, they, they uh, Magellan and Columbus were very good seat of the pants sailors. So they could read the winds and the tides and get a sense of a favorable direction to go in, even if they didn't really understand the maps. They, um, there were maps that they had, but they were often inaccurate. And there's this, I know a scene in the Magellan book I write about where he was trying to rely on his maps when he was crossing the Pacific. And he finally just threw them overboard because they were just so wrong. And uh, he, they just had a trust in uh, what they, uh, you know, would, they came across. Um, finally, uh, they became aware of the trade winds, which was a boon. You know, the, on the, on the, the, you know, the downside was trying to cross the largest body of water on the planet, which was the Pacific Ocean. The upside was the trade winds, which were not really known, which they discovered by accident, you know, which blew steadily and blew the ships more or less in the right direction uh, toward the east. And uh, they could just ride uh, the trades. So that that made um, somewhat simpler. Meanwhile, they, they did have health problems and uh, the, the most important one was scurvy um, and caused by the lack of vitamin C. This is something we started hearing about, you know, at least I did in grade school anyway. And when you have a vitamin C deficiency, an extreme one, uh, you know, your teeth drop out and your bones begin to fall apart. And, uh, you know, it it's, weakens you and it's, it's terrible. Sailors, Arab sailors who were more advanced at that time by far, uh, were aware that uh, citrus, um, you know, Im immediately uh, fixed the problem. And uh, eventually um, Columbus, Magellan, and other sailors realized that as long as they had some kind of fresh fruit or even beer or other things that had some sort of uh, uh, vitamin C, that, the, that, that would keep the scurvy at bay. Um, and uh, so they, they, they needed to, you know, be in touch or have some some way to get something fresh on on board their ships um, in order to do that. Uh, you, you know, it could be a jam of some sort that saved Magellan's life because he had a little supply of uh, uh, jam that happened to have uh, a lot of citrus and vitamin C in it. He didn't even realize that it was, you know, um, you know, very healthy for him. He just considered it a delicacy, but it contributed to saving his life and. So eventually the effects of scurvy and vitamin C and the, the remedies, you know, became much better known. Uh, but at that time it was hit or miss. Sure it was. And uh, beer, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, because beer, beer had it and some different kinds of grass. So it wasn't, it wasn't just oranges and tangerines, you know, although they, those of course counted, but there were others. And uh, yeah, sailor, sailors were, you know, very fond of beer. Um, which they imbibed, and uh, you know, again, they didn't really have 
you know, clear water or clean water in the way that we think of. So anything that was in some ways uh, prepared or processed or sterilized, you know, was, was, was helpful. Well, everybody that's listening, make sure you eat your oranges and drink your beer for <laughs> the best health that you can be in. <laughs> Well, before I let you go, then we you you have you're just a wealth of knowledge on on this topic and these explorers. So, if if our listeners would like to read your books, um, what which ones should we focus on as far as this time period? I know that you've written something on Drake. You've written something on Magellan. Tell us about those books. Well, I mean, the most recent book is uh, In Search of a Kingdom. Uh, which came out uh, a year ago, and that's about uh, Francis Drake. He was the second circumnavigator, the one who sailed for England and Queen Elizabeth, um, and he successfully did this. Um, and uh, so that might be a good way to start. Perhaps the most, the best known of these books I've written is Over the Edge of the World, which is um, kind of a thriller about Magellan's circumnavigation because it was a thrilling voyage. And... Uh, you know, they're all available, you know, and Amazon and the usual places. I would say Columbus also, uh, that was published about five or six years ago. And, um, you know, that's, you know, there are many books about Columbus. Um, I tried to write about not just the first, the first voyage that we all know about, but the three subsequent voyages as well, because they really all go together. And you see sort of both the evolution and deterioration of Columbus um, as he keeps going back and forth between uh, Europe and the New World and, uh, you know, becomes more and more um, kind of loses his marbles along the way. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a, you know, really interesting, fascinating story. Columbus is a endlessly fascinating character and whether you consider him you know a monster will you know e even now he's you know it's still a kind of an awe-inspiring story uh and uh so those those would be the ones to read also in the background it's not a nautical story particularly is marco polo who inspired many many of these people and of course there's his own travels uh which are available in print and then i wrote a book about marco polo and his travels so that's that's kind of in the background so that would be um you know sort of a little bit off off the subject no but we i think that we'd recommend all of them based on our conversation today i'm i'm dying to read all of them Thank you so much to our guest today. Again, we've got Lawrence Burr Green with us. And thank you to our listeners who wrote in with questions. Of course, we couldn't do it without you guys. And to everyone listening to this week's episode. As always, we appreciate your support and we hope you'll tune in again next time as we continue to ask the experts the pressing questions you want answered. And if you love the Tuner's Dynasty podcast and want to show even more support, please consider becoming a patron where you'll not only receive the great content we offer now, but extra insider research, info, prizes, and other exciting opportunities only offered by subscribing. So until next time, I'm your host, Steph Storr, and thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.